Through 18th century colonial Virginia, the James River flows to the sea. Along its banks, tree-lined tidewater inlets lie tranquil under the warm sun of early spring. And the plantation lawn is green with new growth, home of James Scott, tobacco planter of modest means and member of the Virginia House of Burgesses. On the Scott lands, slaves accompany with a song their work of clearing new ground, while Mr. Scott and his overseer Peters ride over the plantation on a tour of inspection. In the valley This will be Mr. Scott's last inspection of his lands before he leaves for his political duties in Williamsburg, the colonial capital. What do you calculate the new clearings will yield this year, Peters? About four hogsheads, I should say, sir. The lands up in the Piedmont should yield five or six more than last year. I think we shall have a good cargo for Captain Marsden in October. While Mr. Scott and Peters continue their round, Mrs. Scott pauses in her preparations for the forthcoming trip to Williamsburg to gather flowers that have come to early bloom. To Mrs. Scott, flowers yield as great a satisfaction as her husband finds in abundant crops of tobacco, or as son Thomas experiences in riding his favorite thoroughbred. In the plantation blacksmith shop, Tom Scott finds Henry Cobden, an indentured servant, making new hardware for plantation buildings. Working with hammer, anvil, forge, and hand-operated bellows, Henry makes such hardware as is not more easily imported from England. Good morning, Mr. Stone. Good morning, Henry. Uh, how does the work on the coach come on? Well, I had to leave it and finish these hinges for the new building, but I'll have it ready, though. Are we going in the morning? Oh, it'll be ready. Thomas probably feels that repairing the family coach for the Williamsburg trip is much more important just now than work on hinges for new plantation buildings. Tom's sister Betsy is likewise preoccupied with thoughts of Williamsburg as she packs for the long-awaited trip. You sure got to look mighty sweet, Miss Betsy, when you wear that to the dancing as soon as at Williamsburg. I hope so, Nellie. Captain Marsden picked this out in London especially for me. Certainly will be good to get back in Williamsburg again. Before leaving to join Ginians in the House of Burgesses, Mr. Scott has many letters to write and letters from his constituents to reread. This one speaks of a serious problem, taxation without representation. The writer urges that the matter be given full attention in Williamsburg where, over the capital of the Royal Colony of Virginia, the British flag waves aloft, hailed by crowds of colonists assembled for the public times. Here, earnest conversations take place on every hand as townspeople and visitors exchange news and opinions. To the governor's palace go spokesmen on special missions, and, paralleling the political activities, are preparations for banquets, in which Virginia hands may be featured. Preparations for dinners which call forth the best efforts of Williamsburg cooks, whose culinary skill will be tested by critical palates. For the parties and dances which characterize public times, punch is prepared, and an extra supply of candles must be available for the evening festivities. Thus it is that as the Scott coach leaves the plantation miles behind, in the long drive to distant Williamsburg, the thoughts of both Mrs. Scott and Betsy are centered around the good times which the wheels of their coach are bringing ever closer. Traveling on horseback, Mr. Scott and Thomas follow close behind the coach, which completes its journey on a Rywayne home, where the Scots are to be entertained during their stay in town. Their visit is the occasion of a happy reunion with their good friends, the Waynes, whom they have not seen for several months. 
And now Mr. Scott and Thomas have also completed the long journey. The Scots, like other visitors to Williamsburg during public times, have good reason to know why the capital is also the social center of the colony. Hospitality is liberally extended and genuinely enjoyed. While the ladies chat over tea, the men consider political problems. The latest fashions from London and the forthcoming social functions are favorite topics with the ladies. But just now, the conversation turns to Mrs. Wayne's son, who is ill. Now, you mustn't worry about John. Thomas had the fever but recently, and he's well and hearty now. At the barber shop, where the red and white striped pole is a sign that bloodletting is practiced, John Wayne awaits treatment for a lingering fever. In line with customary procedure in such cases, a bleeding bowl is first placed in position. Next, the barber takes the instrument which he will use in making the minute wound, a short, sharply pointed knife. And now, with all in readiness, the barber proceeds. John reassures himself with the thought that Tom Scott recently underwent the same treatment. Bloodletting is believed to be helpful in treating a wide variety of ailments. At the completion of the almost painless procedure, the barber places a bandage over the wound. It is John's hope and expectation that his condition will presently improve. While John and Tom concern themselves with a problem of personal health, their fathers are absorbed in the political problems under consideration at the Capitol. This problem of the Indians out beyond the mountain is going to be very serious until they are subdued. I think the governor can be brought to see our point of view. I hope so. But regardless of what is done about the Indian question or taxation, shopping remains a major concern of the ladies. This afternoon, they visit a cobbler's shop. All shoes are made to special order, and sample models are offered for the inspection of the prospective buyers. While considering their decision as to choice of style, Betsy and Mrs. Wayne look on with close interest as the cobbler continues his work. Skilled hand craftsmanship enters into every stage of the building up of the shoe. Mrs. Scott also finds the process absorbing as the cobbler manipulates leather, last, and hand implements. Every pair of shoes worn in the colony must be made in this or a similar manner. The cobbler is one of the most important of colonial artisans. Later in the day, at the College of William and Mary, Tom Scott, having taken John home to rest, calls on his friend Alan Cole, who is studying for the ministry. Leaving the college, Tom and Alan pass the powder magazine, storage place of powder for the muskets of the colonial militia. Presently, in the course of their stroll, they arrive at the local jail, just in time to witness a lawbreaker being placed in the pillory. This is the reward for spreading malicious gossip. At such an offender, passers-by are privileged to throw mud. But Tom and his friend spare both the occupant of the pillory and a fellow prisoner whose drunkenness has consigned him to the stocks. In the evening, while waiting to leave for a ball at the governor's palace, Betsy plays the spinet, a popular colonial instrument. At her dressing table, Mrs. Scott completes her preparations for the ball. This will be an occasion long to be remembered when the Scots have returned to their plantation. While waiting for the ladies, Tom and John examine some dueling pistols. In the study, their fathers sit talking before the fire. Sometimes, George, I wonder what this friction over taxation and other matters may lead to. Well, I expect everything will come out all right at the end. I believe Virginia will go right on being a prosperous and loyal colony. Perhaps so, but the Western Territory is opening up, and changes are taking place right here, too. The spirit of liberty seems to be growing stronger every year. It is like this fire. It was only a spark in the beginning, but it grew. Your words are ominous, sir. 
perhaps george just thinking and wondering